common argument for the existence of God goes something along the lines of in the beginning there was nothing now there is something how can something have or something cannot just spontaneously come from nothing and therefore there must be a God now apart from the fact that that conclusion first of all is a non sequitur there are a number of assumptions that are just kind of put there in front of you and glossed over very quickly as if they are evidently true but why would they be? Like, For example, the first assumption, in the beginning. Why would there have to be a beginning? There was nothing. How can you be sure about that? And something cannot come from nothing. Says who? But let's just look at this. Let's dissect the whole argument a bit further. Let's just get down to the nitty gritty of it. Now I'm going to give you an explanation and this explanation is going to be in English and that is going to present you with a problem because in English I'm going to have to present it as a narrative and the narrative tends to suggest a temporal element and you will hear me say things that start to this and then you do that and that's what you need to understand all the way through the argument is that the argument is based on logical implication and logical implication is not a temporal thing so in other words if A implies B logically that means that simultaneously if A is true B is also true time doesn't come into it there is no beginning to that narrative there is no end to the narrative there is no flow that's just the way I'm going to present this so let's start from an assumption of nothing at all and the other thing you're going to have to understand is that even though what I'm going to construct here and remember construct is not the normal sense of the word it's an implication I'm going to explore here but what I end up constructing is an abstraction however just because it's an abstraction doesn't mean it isn't real yes it's not in itself physical and cannot be touched but that doesn't make it unreal okay let's get to the nitty gritty assuming nothing we can look at this from a different perspective. We can look at nothing from the perspective of set theory. And we can look at that saying like, well, let's consider the set of all that exists. Well, we started off with nothing, so you know the set of all that of all that exists is then by definition something called the empty set. Well, let's just elevate that one step. Let's once again look at the set that of all that exists. Well, that set now contains something called the empty set. So we now got a set in which there is something which is also a set which is called the empty set. So now we have the the empty set, and we've got this new set that contains that contains the empty set. So if we now again look at the set of all that exists, we've got a set that contains the empty set, a set that contains the empty set. So now we've got the empty set, a set that contains the empty set, and a set that contains the set that contains the empty set. This is a recursive process that can be repeated at infinitum. And remember again, no time involved here. And let's look at what we've got as we keep on constructing these things because we'll end up with sets. Now first of all, sets are abstractions, but they're real. Secondly, every set has something called a cardinality. 
Now, cardinality gets very confusing when you're talking about sets containing infinite numbers of elements, but if you're looking at sets that contain finite number of elements, cardinality is fairly simple because it's just basically a number that represents a number of elements in the set. So if we look at the sets that we've just constructed this way, we've got the empty set, which contains zero elements. Then we've got the next set we constructed, which contains the set that con contains the empty set, which is therefore a set that contains one element. Then we contain this, the next setup, which contains the empty set, and this new set, which contains two elements. So if we look at the cardinalities of all those sets, we find that we've just got the natural numbers. Now think about this. All of what I've just told you, you know, sounds like somebody constructing sets, considering things, but that's just the language that I'm using to explain this to you. What we are looking at here at a fundamental level is a logical implication. And therefore, what we have to realize then is that from the assumption of nothing at all, we arrive at the conclusion that this logically implies the existence of natural numbers. Now, natural numbers are abstractions. They are things, they are like labels that we use to count things. But, like I said before, abstractions or not, they are nonetheless real. So, what have we just derived here? What have we just concluded here? Nothing, the assumption of nothing, implies the existence of natural numbers. Therefore, and this is what you need to realize, therefore, there cannot be nothing. Nothingness is a logical impossibility. And that, no matter how trivial the example is, pulls the rug right out from under people who say, in the beginning there was nothing, because no. First of all, was there a beginning at all? But even if we grant that possibility, there can never have been nothing, because at the very least, there will have been the natural numbers. And any other, any other thing that can be mathematically derived like that. And it doesn't matter that maths in itself is a logical discipline invented by humans. That doesn't make the argument any less true, and it doesn't make the conclusion any less inescapable. So therefore, nothingness is logically impossible. And any argument based on you cannot get something from nothing is therefore null and void. What other argument might you have for supporting your belief in God?